Well, when I mix, a lot of people do this. It's not just me. I will print back into Pro Tools a mix track, but then I'll bust that as well to a heater track, which is the same mix, except I'll put a plug-in on it that's moving. Oh, the heater, like the loud one, yeah. the loud version. And okay. that's simply just so the artist can hear a loud version of it. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Today's episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is sponsored by Roswell Pro Audio, maker of handcrafted microphones in California. Inspired design and impeccable attention to detail will help you capture a gorgeous vintage sound without the vintage price tag. Check out their beautiful line of microphones at roswellproaudio.com. You may already know that using true analog gear is one of the best ways to create a great record. Yet increasingly, we live in a digital world, recording and mixing inside the computer. So what if you could have the best of both worlds? Tegeler Audio Manufacturer is bridging the analog-digital divide by creating high-end analog gear like the Schwerkraft Maschine compressor and the Raumzeit Maschine reverb whose knobs you can control remotely using a plug-in in your DAW. Or their many analog units like the Cream Bus Compressor with Mastering EQ or the Very Tube Recording Channel that let you save your settings using a custom recall sheet plugin, offering a complete line of pro audio gear from compressors to EQs to reverbs and beyond. Now you can get a pro analog sound while benefiting from the power of digital. Let your DAW help you move your knobs so that your music can move you. Click the link in the show notes to learn more about Tegeler Audio Manufactor. Hey, rock stars! It's your host, Lid Sean. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Mitch Dane, a Grammy-winning engineer and producer with over 25 years of making great records with singer-songwriters, roots rock, bluegrass Americana, and alt-country artists. He shares an incredible studio here in Berry Hill with Vance Powell called Sputnik Sound that makes you feel immediately at home and creative. With artwork on the walls and colors everywhere, there's even a swing hanging from the ceiling right in the middle of the tracking room, which <laughs> my daughter remembered uh, when I was talking to her this morning. I, was, I asked her, I was like, so did we swing on that swing? She was like, of course yeah, I remember that. Notable artists Mitch has worked with include Jars of Clay, Humming House, Kenny Foster, Sonia Lay, and The Young Fables, among many, many others. With over 250 records to his discography, Mitch has recorded in many styles of music and even won an award for songwriting from ASCAP. In Mitch's own words, quote, I like to collect the best aspects of every genre of music and bring them together in hybrid productions. Please welcome Mitch Dane to Recording Studio Rockstars. Mitch. Hey. Are you ready to rock, dude? Absolutely. Here um, we go. I've given a brief intro here, but, and I've tried to describe this place, but, you know, I was writing that from back at home before I got here. And then being here, I feel like I, I, I shortchanged it. I mean, it's like, it's really amazing what you've done in this studio. Um, tell us, uh, we can come back to that too, but, but um, tell us in your own words how you got started out in recording. Like, how did you arrive at this incredible place here? Well, I, uh, I was a singer-songwriter myself for a long time. And uh, I didn't know much about recording, but I had to find a way to capture my sound to sell it and just through trial and error I figured out a way to to make it work and it's very rudimentary and now it's kind of slightly embarrassing but a lot of records I went straight to whether it was tape or to dat digital tape and just duplicated it but through that process I learned that that's what I really enjoy doing is the process of... The process of recording and yeah. capturing all the music. And even though I think it's important that I've I learned how to to take a song and 
I can relate to an audience on the stage. It um, capturing it in the studio is really engaging. It's 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 exciting for me. Yeah. So I figured out a way to do it for the rest of my life. <laughs> I remember and, feeling that way myself when I was beginning this stuff too. Like I, I was learning guitar and learning mm-hmm. how to play music first, and then. You know, I'm wandering around the dorm room and there's some, I walk into a room and there's there's a couple of guys there who also play guitar and they were making songs on their cassette deck, which was yeah. like two cassettes in it. <clears throat> and I was like, holy shit, what do you mean you're making songs on that? How do you do that? <laughs> What's a song, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, uh, and it was pretty, pretty cool to see that. Um, and then, you know, when I had a four track and people invited me over to, to record something they were doing like the thing that made me an engineer and the guy was, you know, either I had the four track or I was the guy who could kind of figure out how to connect all the radio shack adapters yeah. so that the mic could go into the, you know, the, yeah. the square peg could go into the round hole. Yeah. Um, so I totally know what you mean. It's like when you're in the music and you just gravitate towards all this technology and yeah. stuff. Yeah. Do, what, do you remember seeing a studio for the first time or anything like that? I think my first studio experience was with an engineer named Craig Hansen, who did a lot of work with Charlie Peacock. And Charlie and I knew each other a little bit from church. And Craig invited me to come over and watch for a couple days, and he gave me kind of a crash course on signal flow. And and at that time, it was a strip mall studio. In and Nashville? Yeah, it was in Bellevue. In Bellevue. Uh, Are you from Nashville originally? I've been here 30 years. Oh, say, about the same as me. So, yeah, it feels like home. Where were you be- before that? A small town in Cape Girardeau, named Cape Girardeau in Missouri. Oh, yeah. It, um, it's actually outside of Cape Girardeau, very, very small town. I think the population was about five, probably about five. <laughs> no. uh, so that's about the same time I came here, which was 91 for me. 88 is when I moved here. 88, okay, cool. And... um. You know, I came from, pretty much came from St. Louis at that point. Oh, yeah. Where I'd been in school. And uh, do you ever feel like Missouri, Cape Girardeau, um, St. Louis, like we kind of, uh, you know, you, you're in your credit, I mentioned alt country. Do you ever feel like we were sort of responsible in that that location for alt country? Or or we just caught, caught part of a wave at that time? Well, I don't know. I think being on the Mississippi River and having... Nomads come over from the foothills of the Ozarks and playing their guitars and banjos. And I think we, I don't know, maybe we had something to, to do with it. I, <laughs> I just remember Uncle Tupelo coming out of St. Oh, Louis, yeah. and I felt like the birth of the, the name Alt Country was from that late 80s into the 90s, mm-hmm. you know, too. Do you remember a music store in St. Louis called On Page Avenue? What, what was, it? Was, it, it was it? It was a big Describe music store. It. What was it like? They had a lot of keyboards. That. I was really into keyboards back then. Um, yeah, there were some cool. We I I was over in the U City Loop area because okay. I was in school at, at Washington University at that time. So I remember. Um, uh, actually, I don't remember the name of it, but there was a music store there where I got my first guitar, and there was a guy there named Mike King who was fixing guitars, and then went on to open his own shop, and he specialized in. Um, silver tones and oh, yeah. harmonies and all these really great sort of, um, I think he was, you know, sort of connected to a, a blues scene, sort of an mm-hmm. old school blues scene that we're really using these, you know, left of center guitar brands. Yeah. Um, but it was pretty cool stuff. Yeah. That's all of those brands. Are really cool. Well, so, um, so you're in Nashville, you see a studio and this was like a real, uh, it was in a strip mall though. Yeah. Was it a sort of a fancy studio at the time? No, no, no. It was, he was actually building out the art house to be a studio. And it was just like a temporary rental. And the vocal booths were, it was kind of like in a dressing room where they had these huge pieces of foam, like old foam hinge. Foam hinge. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, all the gear was great and Craig was talented and knew what he was doing. Yeah. Well, it's a lot of fun when you make your first studios and, and the um, the pleasure of sort of learning how to record in a, in any space that you have. I remember being in kitchens and living rooms and, you know, hanging extra fuzzy blankets on mic stands to try and deaden the room a little bit. And then, oh, yeah. And then being kind of shocked that it actually worked. <laughs> yeah, I, I uh, 
used to record drums in a laundry room and it's just a tiny little kit and uh I didn't have extra channels to record the bottom and top snare. So I molted it and then fly, face flipped it and just like, well, I guess that's... That's a good way to do it. So wait, if you molted it and face flipped it, so you were probably recording a tape at that point too, right? Or It was or like ADAT. ADAT, yeah. 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 Um, that was a big game changer for us at that time too. It really was. I mean, do you think, well, I don't know, this is just a random question, but how do you think things might have been different if, uh, well, it's probably a moot question since things were going to change and new technology was going to show up. But I mean, you know, ADATs allowed us to be at, a, at that point and go like, hey, you know what? I think I might want to create my own studio mm -hmm. as yep. a young guy starting out, as opposed to the only option is to go get a job in a big studio somewhere. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And then I think the next big innovation that allowed that was the, the 001 Pro Tools did you? Oh yeah, the Digio one. Yeah, I yeah. still got one in the closet. Really? Yeah. Those those changed everything for for young producers. You know, this might sound nutty, but I remember feeling like the Digio one worked pretty well. Oh yeah. You got your foot in the door with Pro Tools, which at that time was a massive program. Yeah. That I remember Charlie telling me, "Don't do it because it's too complicated." Too complicated just to learn. Yeah. And uh. I kind of had no other choice because I knew I wanted to do this. So dove in. Um, so what about tape? Did, are you using tape here at Sputnik as well? We have that option. We do use it occasionally, but most artists just are fine with Pro, Pro Tools, especially yeah. with our converters. We're using the Burl converters. Oh, yeah. Is it the Mothership or something yeah, like that? Yeah, it sounds so good. Tell us about that. You're, the, uh, I believe, the second person on the podcast to talk about the Mothership. I was sold Which is on, also a great Captain Beefheart lyric. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the blimp, the blimp. That's hilarious. Um, that brings back memories. Um, the Mothership was sold to me when I heard a comparison. This was at 192 with tape at 30 hips, and you could go back and forth and compare... Pro Tools recording to a, to a tape recording, and I, I couldn't tell the difference. And I can usually hear something, and all the other engineers were in the same boat. They're like, it just it sounds amazing. Wow. So so you feel like it almost had a tape quality to yeah. it. And uh, what would you describe? Like, what what equals a tape quality? What is I, What is a tape quality? To me, it is like if you were forced to put it into words. It's like it's kind of a, a cushion. Gives the especially on a digital format that can be brittle and bright. It softens and but it softens it up without being squishy. But it's not necessarily like tape compression. No. Okay. I think the transformers and the burls, you know, it speaks for itself. It going through more electricity yeah. and more, so more circuitry. It sounds more appealing. Yeah. Sm smoother, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, I do feel that when I listen to older records that aren't necessarily loud mm -hmm. and aren't necessarily pulling out all kinds of mixing tricks. But um, gosh, what was I just listening to that made me feel that way? Oh, it was some old Warren Zevon records. Mm -hmm. And I just felt like I was like, you know, but I just want to crank them. Something yeah. about like those records and that that style of recording and and uh, mixing, even you know. Yeah, because it, it there there was dynamics still in it. So when you cranked it and they hit that chorus, it was loud. Yeah, it and just tonally, like like yeah. those tones. Uh, I don't know. There's a richness to quality to things yeah. sometimes, and I feel like you. Um, I feel like I hear that in a lot of your productions too. Like you still, that that style of production and creation of sound still appeals to you, you know? It, yeah, it does. Now I have to warn you, if you ask too many technical questions. You'll just send me home. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show my ass because I'm, I'm, I'm not the engineer's engineer. Like you can go down the hall and talk to Vance. He'll, uh -huh. he'll Which tell, we did. And he'll, yeah, he'll tell you 
how and why the gear works. I just know how it sounds and, and how to tweak it. And I'd... So, Rockstars, um, I was here to interview Vance mm -hmm. at the beginning of the podcast, which I believe was um, it was in the episode, The Teens, somewhere. Uh, and And when I showed up this morning to interview Mitch, he hands me, he goes, oh, by the way, you left your power strip here. And we're on episode, this will be like 139 or 40 or something oh, like that. So it's hilarious. Awesome. <clears throat> so thank you for that, man. Sure, absolutely. Um, and then, of course, I asked you, I was like, well, shit, did I walk off with one of your power supplies? Uh, I'll find out later if I've <laughs> yeah. got one that says Vance on the bottom of it. Yeah, you, you will. Um, well, so, but, but you know, I think there's so many different styles to recording, too. There's the... Uh, the engineers engineer there there are people who approach this and are really fascinated by you know all the trickery you might do inside a pro tool session now mm -hmm. and then there's also that balanced against an approach that says i really just want to kind of capture a pure tone on the way in like taking a really clear photograph maybe mm -hmm. and then once i've got that um let's not mess it up you know yeah. uh you know even richard dodd and his words on on the interview was he, the more he's learned about recording is just to try uh, um, to get more and more out of the way and, and not screw it up, mm -hmm. not mess up the process. Um, tell us about this beautiful place. Tell us about Sputnik putting this together. You know, how did you even, how do you even get it to look like this? The, to me, this, I would describe this as um, almost like the, the example of, Nashville style, if that's if that's fair. Like there was something I discovered when I came here to Berry Hill. Um, the only store that pops into mind, Pangea is over in uh oh, yeah. in in um Hillsborough Village. Sure. Just like all these cool artifacts and uh the way you guys have painted everything. It just how how do you describe that? What is that to you? Well when I grew up in southeast Missouri, my parents were older and there wasn't a lot to do in a small town, so I, I made tree houses and clubhouses, and uh, I think this is kind of an extension of that. You know, about that's a cool idea. I like tree house, and um, studio is a good place to hang out. It is, and I wanted it to be a place that was comfortable and artists felt creative. And there's also a a place in Graydon Beach, Florida, called the Red Bar. It's one of my favorite places to go, and it's um, they have great food, but just the atmosphere there, it, it's kind of like this on stereo steroids. Recently, they've put up a bunch of flat screen TVs and have sports on them. Like <laughs> that's just the way the world has. They right? just ruined it for me. <laughs> I'll still go there for the black and mighty mighty. If you put up a flat screen TV here at Sputnik, maybe you can just. Make the screensaver on that flat screen TV pictures of Sputnik. Yeah, that, right. that would that would work. There's something really odd about that, but um, yeah, I, I like nature. I like being outside. This wood that's on the walls is from the original house that was here. Oh, so we, it's reclaimed from the building. That yeah, was we, the same spot. we used okay. as much of it as we could. Yeah, it's really cool. And then, um, how did you come up with the idea to put a swing in the in the uh, the tracking room there? Well, not too long after it was finished, I had a day where I was just kind of doing maintenance, and I walked in there and I was like, "We have a twelve foot ceiling. You know what? What could uh, what can we do with that?" And really? If I was a kid and I had a twelve foot ceiling, what would I want to do? With yeah, it? yeah. I, I was always fascinated by. Rube Goldberg machines and yeah. pulleys, and I still want to make a a pulley system between here and Vance so I can send notes to him. You know, my daughter and I played our first game of Mousetrap. Oh this yeah, year. yeah. We waited a little bit. She's twelve, so I may have yeah. waited a little bit long on that one. That's that's a that's an odd game. It is an odd. Game. I don't even know anyone who's actually played the game. But you just build it. Well, it was, we were lucky because, um, you know, I think it was a, a, a fairly recent purchase, you know, for my sister, for my, my niece and nephew, I think it was. And so all the pieces were still there because yeah. that's really what it boils down yeah. to. If you're missing the pieces. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't know what the analogy is to studios and making records and, you know, hoping you have all the pieces. But I feel like when I make records, 
I count on the fact that I never have all the pieces and I always have to figure oh, out yeah. how to do it regardless. I mean, even just showing up for this interview, what was I missing? I was pretty good. I was pretty good, but I was yeah. still missing the little adapter for sure. the headphone, the screw on thing, right? But we managed. But we managed. We figured it out. <laughs> I, I used yours. <laughs> Well, so um, Mitch, I like to ask guests to share an inspirational quote on the on the podcast. Is there anything that comes to mind for you? Yes, um, it's always no. It's never no. That's not it. <laughs> <laughs> See, but we're gonna figure it out. No. It's like studio life. No, it, I think I don't know how to put this into a quote as much as a philosophy, but. To have the courage to ask your friends to help you become a better version of yourself. Yeah, that's good advice. And that, that could be either as an engineer or producer or also just a human being. I don't want to be a jerk. And I need my friends to tell me, hey, you're, you're being a jerk. Do you, and, yeah. and I have friends that do that, and I'm so thankful. Um, I usually preface my relationship with my interns. Well, maybe not preface, but once they're interning and we're having a conversation, um, I just, I tend to apologize in advance. (laughs) (laughs) Cause I, I know that I can be uh, a challenge to be around and to work with in the studio. And I'm just like, look, this is just, I'm just apologizing to you up front and listen. I'm, and then I remind myself to tell them, to just thank them for being there. Like yeah. I'll walk around grumpy or something or, or could be interpreted that way. And then I pause. I'm like, Hey man, I'm just really glad you're here today. Yeah. I, same sentiment. I, I tell the, the guys that, that keep short accounts. And if, if I do something that tick you off, tell me about it. And because it, if not, it's just going to fester and you're going to get more angry and more angry. And then you're going to blow up in my face and, well, let's let's throw yeah. that at a couple of examples. So <clears throat> if we're getting our song together, let's say we're in the songwriting stage. I mean, you know, a cool thing about doing this interview with you is I can really, we can talk about, you know, the birth of a song through mm-hmm. the completion of an album. And who knows, maybe we can even talk about how, you know, what, what's everybody supposed to do with that record once it's out too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, the real the question of the day, right? But um in the uh, the birthing of a song, um, what are some ways that you find it's helpful to ask for advice? You know, to uh, I'm forgetting the exact wording of of what you just said, but you know, to reach out for feedback and make sure that your 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 friends oh. are helping you get the song as good as it can be. Oh yeah, yeah. I think when you go into a writing session or pre production or whatever. I'll tell the artist, I, I'll have a ton of ideas, but not all of them are great. And just bear with me. Let me sift through some of that. So, like, allow me to to present some pretty shitty ideas. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And sometimes I'll I'll start playing a, something I have in mind, and before I even finish, I'll be like, oh, that's stupid. <laughs> Forget that. And then sometimes I, I'll feel like, I really feel like this will make the song better and they may resist you know may resist a little bit and I'll ask him if we could just live with it for even an hour and see if it catches him you know, sometimes it does sometimes it doesn't yeah um, what is a writing session if somebody was like if you were to explain to somebody who doesn't know anything about this it depends on if I'm writing with the artist for their record or just two writers getting together to write for a mysterious artist that may or may not ever hear the song. Right. And that's okay, and that's that happens. That you happens get together time. and just write just to write. Just to write, yeah. It, it's always... The practice always helps you become better, obviously. But if I'm working with an artist, it I have to know what we're writing for, what... The record's going to be about what's the themes, what's the one thing you want to say with this record. And then I know that that's, there's game, there's, there's things that we can pull from to, to feed that song. How often does an artist 
show up and either know what the answer to that is or not know what the answer to that is? Um, I do a pretty good job of prefacing that through e- communication emails before they get here. So we'll have a good idea when we start. Um, maybe, okay, so so n- we're in the pre-production stage of a record and this co-writing part is, is part of the... Um, having identified that we're going to work together and that we've talked about some of these themes and now we're co-writing together. Um, do you want to, do you have any more comments about outlining what a process might look like from the very first conversations to even getting to that stage? Cause all this stuff I think is really helpful to all of us. Just sure. sort of, sometimes I find myself conceptualizing, well, you know, how do I, how do I do something like that if I haven't done that before? Are you asking like? Well, like, so you, you maybe you, you've met somebody, maybe they've expressed some sort of an interest um, in working with you. What are some of the things that happen from that point to now we're co-writing together? And if we're co-writing together, what does that mean? Does that mean that we've um, already made decisions about going into a, the studio to do a record, and have we talked budgets and things yeah, like that? That's great. I think it's been a long time since I've dated. But <laughs> but if I remember right, if I w- walked up to a girl and, and uh, wanted to get to know her better, I can't assume that she wants to get to know me. So there's this, with an artist, there's a, there's kind of a give and take of, well, you expressed you wanted to work with me. I need to hear some demos. I need to hear some rough demos that I know it's not auto-tuned, that... No production tricks. So you can really know who they are. Yeah. And then... Not who the engineer is. Exactly. Exactly. And if I like their stuff, I'll ask them, so what do you want out of this? What Do you want a full-length record? Do you want an EP? What are you going to do with it? And I'll ask questions like, if they have a... If this is their second or third record, I'll ask how many records they sold in the past to see where they fit. You know, if it's over 10,000, then that excites me because I know it's worth an investment. If it's under a thousand, then I have to think how talented they are. Do they have potential to sell 10,000? And why does it matter? Why does it matter if they sell um, any of these records at all to you as the producer? That's a fantastic question. Okay. (laughs) I think it comes down to if I'm willing to invest in them, especially if they have a low budget. If if they have a really low budget, it might be worth it to me to to work with them, especially if they're selling 10,000 records. Maybe it helps a little bit to um, talk about what investment means too, because some people might hear that word and they just think it means, you know, banker writing a check. Investment for me means how much emotional, artistic energy, emotional energy and artistic energy oh, I can afford to put into it. It sounds harsh, but sometimes there's this beautiful artist that comes from a small town and I know that he or she will only sell 200 records but there's something beautiful about that and I want to help them do that if I can yeah especially if if my season of you know there's a down week or two and I can fit them in it's yeah I enjoy doing that yeah because I was that guy yeah right we all started out from yeah. somewhere like that right and um even if it's just their dream to do to one song, you know, I'll do it. Well, um, and, you know, I think it's important for us to all remember that there are some things that we always have in limited supply. Time is one of them. You know, time is one of them. But I think it's good for you to, um, you know, to remind us that that emotional um, contribution to a record is you know, while while the there there may be endless love in the world, uh, there's still like you know a limited supply of that emotion that you can put into something. 
before you've replenished it and are ready for the next thing. So, you know, there is a level of um, investment in every record we do that is not just, you know, money. Or I think if somebody hears the word investment, they might think, oh, are we talking about, you know, points on records now or something? I don't actually, I don't even know if anybody talks about points on records what, anymore. What, it seems like, what a, are these points you speak it's like a 20 year old term <laughs> at this point. I don't know. But, um, you know, it's there is a there's an emotional and there's a creative energy that um, you know if you use it up, you're gonna have to wait around for it to fill back up for the next project. Too, yeah, right. And I, you know, I have a studio and I'm an engineer, and often I get hired just to be an engineer. So my emotional investment and artistic investment is pretty low. I'll just get great sounds that they can take and do whatever they want to with them. Right. But if they want me to be involved creatively, then it's the game changer for me. It's yeah, like, totally. And that was my question, wasn't it? It was like that, yeah. you know, early stage of getting to the writing point and, and getting into the studio. Um, let's, let me ask you a question around that, that relates to, you know, it's the boring money kind of stuff. What advice do you have for people about how to go about figuring out budgets going into records? I, it may be that in that case we just described, really the only the only question is the one to the artist is like, what's your budget? You mm -hmm. know, and go from there. But do you have some other advice for people? What are, what are some of the things that people tend to forget a, to to think about as far as how to um, look at a record and make sure that you can afford the emotional, the time, and the monetary investment going into it? It's a complicated question, and uh, you can just give you can give me like you can just make a joking answer and keep it short if you want. No, to. no, I, I think for you and I, who have studios that we've built from the ground up, and we have so many. There's so many details to a studio. People forget that that cost us money to do that. Yeah, and it's different from a guy who has a computer in their bedroom. And the budget should be different. Yeah. If you want to spend five grand on a record, I can't do that. But if you want to make a record in a studio and with real players and a, a real producer, quote yeah. unquote, yeah, then let's talk. So I, th I think the budgets they vary. They should vary quite a bit. Right. Of course. Yeah. And they they have in in our if you looked at our lives and career paths that, yeah. you know, the first gear I had and what I was making a record on looked like something totally different than making a record with a full studio. Yeah. Um, you brought up a great thing that I should, I want to ask you about. So you talked about working with great musicians. Um, what are some ways to, as a producer in a studio, sort of acquire great musicians so that when an artist comes to you, you're, you're, you're already thinking like, I know who to call. I know who these people are. I know what it might cost, things like that. Just generally speaking, what are some, what's some good advice around um, finding wonderful musicians to bring in and pair up with an artist in your studio? I found that talent attracts talent. So if you find a great drummer. Let I, them know that they're great. Well, yes, let them know they're great. <laughs> Pay them well but also ask them who they like to play with. Like, I need a bass player. Who would you recommend? Nice. Because they, the talent knows talent, and they'll, they'll point me to some great people. And I've, almost everyone I've collected have been referrals from other talented people. Yeah, I think that's good advice. And it's what you started the podcast with. So don't be afraid to ask for advice from your friends, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. So that's great. Um, good, good way to spin it right back around there. I didn't mean to, but thanks for giving me that credit. All right, wonderful. So um, let me jump into some specific questions here too. Um, uh, you've worked with the Jars of Clay. When I was going through your, your discography, there was once uh, the Long Fall. Uh, not, I don't know if you would specifically remember that particular one, but it had a slow build. It was the kind of quality of a song that was long and slow mm -hmm. build. And I found those to be really challenging at times. So I wondered if you had any tips you wanted to give us for producing and mixing songs with slow builds. I call them the long triangle. Yep. yep. Um, how do we get the dynamic right when we're creating music like that? 
what, or what are the challenges we're going to run into? Maybe that's a good way to ask it. Well, the challenge is obviously that if you want the the back end of the song to explode and be huge, you have to start smaller. Yeah. And if you start too small, then you press play on the song. You're like, Ooh, this yeah. sounds boring. Yeah. Or mastering is going to crunch it up to where it's going to sound really awkward when you push, push play. So you have to find that happy medium. Are there, is it a long crescendo of a song production always just piling more and more on? Or is it also sometimes tricks of cleverly removing things from underneath and getting them out of the way so that it feels bigger, but it's not necessarily just way louder? Uh, It's funny. I don't equate that to adding instruments as much as adding passion from the from the performance. Okay. And whether the guitar player is playing, digging in more, his voice is, or her voice is becoming more passionate. And even the tempo might raise. We've done that to where the, the tempo will escalate. And does that involve um, escalating the tempo? Does that involve cleverly speeding up the, the click track and that kind of stuff? It can. It can. Uh, it's, it's usually more genuine and honest if it's done live so it yeah. just happens nat- naturally yeah uh, there's a song on one of the jars records called oh my god and it starts really slow and we did it without a click and they they just do an amazing job of creating that emotion and it's it's a beautiful song but it, it gets really big and so it's sort of an emotional crescendo yeah um, I think that's good. I think that's a great answer. I mean, it's really what we're picking up on when a song gets more intense anyway. Yeah. There's... I found myself just layering more and more fuzz guitars in the outro, and then I got to like balance it out and mix. I'm like, this sounds like terrible. What am I doing wrong here? How do I make this work? You know? And it seems like with passion comes tension. Yeah. So whether you're having strings play and they can start having notes that kind of fit in the scale, but are rubbing a little bit, Mm -hmm. just creates this tension that's that's really beautiful. Minor second. Yeah. That's a good one, right? All those cool ones. Um, And of course, I guess going up, when the notes go up higher, that gives you, I don't know why I always do like a dumb British accent when I'm trying to be funny, but I do. You can call me out on it. British are pretty funny. (laughs) And sometimes they don't know it. That's true. I like, I like, um, I don't know if I've met anyone from England that I didn't really like. Oh, yeah. That's, what is that there's all some about? Great, great folks in town here. All right, great. So let me jump to another one. Here's a, a Woody Pines was another artist mm-hmm. that you worked with, um, and it had wonderful sounding acoustic instruments in it. Um, one of the most difficult acoustic instruments, which I've had difficult with dif- difficulty with even recently, is the upright bass. Mm. Help us out. What do we need to know about recording? I I almost feel like mixing an upright bass, it's still hard, but it's easier if you have a great recording of it. So what can you tell us about recording an upright bass so that it really sounds good when we capture it? Um, You're right. It is a a difficult instrument to capture. I tend to go with two mics, one being a large ribbon for for the low end, usually a 44 RCA. And the top I'll use a mid to large diaphragm condenser. The room you record in has a lot to do with it. I think the player has the most to do with it. Yeah. Have being a great player. Um, I bust the two together on, on the console, the two mics. Just find the happy medium. Just commit to that thing, and that's what we got. Yeah, and sometimes I don't compress a lot to get the full dynamics of it. And this is weird, but sometimes I add some spring reverb to it. Really? And it just makes it sit in the track really nicely. Do you have an actual spring reverb that you like to use? We do. Um, Are you a, allowed to tell us? Will you have to kill me afterwards? No, no. I, or uh, you, I mean, that's too many of us listening for you to get all of us. No, I, I have to confess, I, I have a tank driver with a, a cool spring on the wall, but 
There's some great plugins to work fine for me. What is a tank driver with a cool spring on the wall? That's just confusing enough to just make somebody's head spin out there. Uh, the tank driver is a 500 series um, piece of gear that's made by radial that's specifically made to drive a reverb tank. And a reverb tank would be, you could pull one right out of the back of an old guitar. Yeah. And then that, that's or what B, or B3 sometimes. sends it to that and then brings it back. Yeah. Yeah, cool. All right, dig it. <clears throat> I like that. That's kind of exciting. Have you ever built your own reverbs? I've only done it with like tubes, like for just a weird kind of filtering thing. I've done it through ductwork. Oh, you mean like literally go through, play music through a tube? Yeah. Or through ductwork. Yeah. Like if a band's playing in one room, just mic the. Does the duck quack a lot when you do that? I mean, <laughs> yes. <in> my heart. <laughs> Especially if you squeeze them. They quack. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, sorry, getting serious here again. Um, okay, so wonderful. So RCA 44 is a big, fantastic ribbon mic. Yeah. Um, where in the world might you position that mic uh, with uh, around the bass to get to get it, the right sound with it? You have to actually get down with your ear and listen to them play. And there's usually a sweet spot. Something. So that, in other words, if it sounds good to your ear, that's a pretty good place yeah. to start with the mic. Because the microphone is basically an ear. And you're just putting the mic where your ear was. I try not to get too close. Maybe like a foot to a foot and a half away. Probably a foot. Right. If you get too close, you get too much proximity on that yeah. mic, right? And you get less of the, the tone to me. The tone is the full top of the uh, the bass and you want to capture that resonance yeah um, and then the small di- or the uh, the second mic which you said which is a medium to large diaphragm actually yeah I'll put it up Where next that? to the fingers and then is it do, so um, what do we have to think about in terms of phase correlation between those two mics how do we how do we address that or how do we think about it um, I will put them the same distance away from the source and which is, if it's a foot, the top mic will be a foot away from their fingers and the bottom mic will be a foot away from the F hole or whatever I'm micing. But then the distance between those two mics, I usually try to put it three times the distance. And I'm not sure if that's even right math. So it's that one to three rule. I remember learning about that in school, and I think it's good to be reminded of. Oh, they actually teach that? Yeah, that's actually they actually teach that. Oh, that's and good if to I know. recall it correctly, it is um imagine you're recording two uh I don't know, two two drums or something, just two instruments that are there next to each other. If the mic is a distance of one from the instrument it's trying to record. And it's a distance of three to the other instrument and the other mic. That's good. That's a good combination. And that should, uh, I don't know if that's sort of for a a rule of panning things left and right in stereo or, and panning the mono, but that's supposed to have a good phase correlation. Great. That's, that's a great example of one of those things I learned by trial and error. Just by doing it enough times. Yeah. Yeah. So if, so for example, if your second mic for the fingers was down lower and too close to the, um, 44, um, you know, it just might start sounding a little screwy to you yeah. somehow. Yeah, you'll probably, in that case, you'll probably start losing some low end because the top mic would start picking up more of the low end and it'd probably be out of, out of phase. Yeah, okay, cool. All right, so then um, let's talk about the other elements of an upright bass. Uh, there's a word I learned when I came to Nashville called wolf tones. What's that all about? Wolf tones. Yeah, okay, or right. maybe I shouldn't ask it like that. Maybe you guys don't use the same word here. But it's the idea of the bass instrument. Sometimes certain notes are much louder than others. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, and I definitely know you, you've you crossed okay. that bridge. So w- what does that mean? What, do you sometimes find a bass has um, certain notes that are booming and just sort of exploding the the low end and other ones are too quiet? Or, or is there any advice around dealing with all that? I usually chalk that up to my room being bad and there's being you know there's like a node or buildup of that that frequency or if it's an electric guitar maybe the the pickup needs to be adjusted 
where that screw needs to be screwed down a little bit more. Right, right, right. In um, Rockstars, let me cl- clarify that. <clears throat> I think you're talking about on an electric bass or an electric guitar, if certain notes are quieter than others, you, you literally turn the screw on the pickup and it can raise it mm-hmm. out of the guitar closer to the strings. So uh, also on a um, single coil, uh, you know, like, I guess the older strats, right? They have individual poles for each string and that, and each of those poles can come out further. And yep. you can, so you can actually like make each string on the guitar louder or softer yep. that way. Yeah. But it, to answer your question, I will, I'll compress it a little bit. And especially if I can put a, an EQ in front of like a presser to catch those frequencies a little, a little more. Um, Do you find that some rooms are too small for an upright bass to speak properly and record it in there? Yes. Depends on the sound you're going for. Like the room I was just recording upright bass in? (laughs) (laughs) Trying to fit it in a kitchen? Well, I have this little ISO booth here, and I recently did a session with Victor Krause. Victor's great. He's a fantastic human being. But the room was small, and I was embarrassed to put him in there, but... The kind of music we were doing, it, it, there wasn't like an open sound. It was more like rock. Right. So I was going to yeah. process it anyways. So. Jason Lenning had told me about um, recording Victor once before and how Victor had a great pickup and like, I don't know if it was a flip top B15 amp mm-hmm. or something like that, mm-hmm. but it was that kind of tone coming out of the amp that was really cool. Uh, maybe you can also comment on you know, the different ways that uh, the right pickup in an upright bass can come to the rescue or not come to the rescue. I was shocked, actually, because Victor insists on recording his DI so he can hear it, so he can have his own or me with the DI. So we, I went ahead and recorded that DI and, and mix. It did sound really cool. It had that growl. That my other mics weren't picking. It kind of comes from the amp too. Yep. So that was a nice. Um, what about mic choice for the amp? When you're taking a DI like that, putting it through an amp, did you think, oh, I better capture this also on put an RCA forty four in front of the amp, or is this sort of a different approach to what the amp's doing? I like. In other words, do you want the amp to capture a big low end as well? No, I. I usually when I either I'm. Um, if I'm reamping a bass or amping it, my bass from the amp is pretty narrow. There's not a ton of low end. It's more of that mid-range grit that I could add to the other signal. Yeah. Do you sometimes have to actually filter some of the low end out of yeah. that mic? Yeah. And it's usually not very loud either. I don't record bass amps very loud. Um, any ballpark frequencies for us to look at as far as filtering out the low end on that that particular one? No, it depends on the amp and the mic okay. and the bass. I mean, like, in other words, if we found ourselves going all the way up to 200, should we be like, whoa, what are you doing? Or like, no, that's that might be just fine for what you need. Uh, 200 it might be this actual sweet spot. Okay, but, cool. But everything below that might be unusable. You yeah, know? okay, cool. Dig it. Awesome. Yeah, see, I like digging into the details on sure. this stuff. I will say 5K to me is like a sweet spot for whether it's electric or upright, to get that. The detail, the yeah, attack, the, the fingers, the, yeah, and, the, and the action, the, the interaction grit, with the bass. Grit, yeah. That's great. That's really helpful, actually. Um, all right, so let's, oh, goodness, what, I was just thinking of something. Oh, yeah, you reminded me, um, you know, you're a songwriter, a player, um, also engineering and producing. Um, talk a little bit about, you know, maybe how often you're putting on a pair of headphones to play an instrument and how often when you do that, you're reminded that that experience might be just the same as being in front of the speakers or totally different from being in front of the speakers. Well, I wouldn't classify myself, classify myself as a player, quote unquote, but there are times when I, I just need a simple rhythm guitar and I can do that. And I think... And rhythm, like maybe acoustic rhythm? Rhythm acoustic, Okay, and that's a great example because there are times where I get an acoustic guitar up and I go get on the mic and I'm like, whoa, turn my track way up, you know, much higher than I might have thought I needed it. 
Oh, is in the control cute. room if I was just the engineer trying to balance it in the truck. Oh, yeah. And I wonder if you um, experienced that or have comments about that kind of dynamic between the the two different viewpoints of oh, what yeah. needs to happen. Yeah, I think obviously I like players to play together and have their mix be feel like a record. But if they're going to perform better with hearing themselves a little more, then absolutely, let's yeah. crank it up. And when I'm playing with the headphones on, I'm thinking ahead about, okay, where's this song going next? And how am I going to get there with my chords and make it clean? Where if I'm listening at the console. How am I going to change chords and not get that big squeak? Yes, exactly. How do you do that? What what are some uh, what is the is there a sort of a trick or something people should know about you know, not having those huge acoustic guitar I'm, squeaks? I'm probably not the guy to ask, <laughs> <laughs> but I know you're acutely aware of it. Oh, right? of course. I mean, there's this all kinds of you know grease you can put on your fingers, and you know I use DS or on acoustic sometimes to get okay. those squeaks out. Cool. Um, I remember seeing an um, RX Isotope R- RX video where they were sort of able to remove squeaks from. Oh, that's cool. And I, I interviewed uh, one of the guys from there too. Um, I think it was Alexi who was talking about how to do that as well. Um, but I, I sort of feel like, as a guitar player myself, it's it's almost like a subconscious, like a mental thing. Like, just don't squeak. Just like lift your fingers and move over here and do. Yeah. Or like, as soon as you stop trying, all of a sudden your guitar doesn't squeak anymore. I don't know yeah. if you ever noticed that too. We know I have a pet peeve, and that is new strings. Yeah. New strings to me sound like metal clanging. But my old Gibson over there has, those strings are probably a year old. And when you strum it, it sounds like wood. And yeah. It, so there's not, there's not a lot of squeak when it comes to that particular guitar. But you can always tell new strings because they squeak That's everywhere. Like, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, so here's another question. This is, um, I had listened to Hannah Miller's record, um, which was fantastic sounding. And I noticed it had some awesome space and depth in the mix. And I wondered if you wanted to talk about some cool ways to get um, reverb and ambience for guitars and vocals on a, on a production. Um, I think in her case and some of your others, there, there are not a whole lot of instruments going on in the mix too. So there's some room for it. Maybe that's the Maybe that's part of the answer is having room in a production. Yeah. I think a lot of that space comes from the room you record in, especially with drums. I think drums on that record, they're sparse, but the decay of of it, it's not reverb as much as just air. You hear air. And I love having the experience of the listener feel that air in the room. Yeah. Because it, it creates this moment of what's coming next. And whether it's between the vocal or or the guitar strums, that's, that's important to me. But then we've also got, you know, dead drums like David Bowie that just sound fantastic. And how do I we, do. you know, how do we correlate these two things sounding so great? It is. It's a, it's a tricky, tricky um, dance. Oh, so another record that I noted was um, Robert Wade, um, Stark Raven Calm, has this big, huge ringing snare mm-hmm. in it, too. Um, and you just reminded me of that when you're talking about drums and, and having the air around stuff. So I wanted to ask you, like, what are some, with regards to getting that air on the drums, what do you want to say about that? And then maybe spin that to um, having best snare choices for a production how do you arrive at like a the right snare sound for a and why the hell do we care so much yeah you have great questions um d- drums is probably my favorite thing to record and on tracking day is probably my favorite day of the week or the month yeah. whatever it is um and it's also the one that makes me most nervous and oh, most scared yeah. most stressed out absolutely and that's prob- probably why i like it because it's Reminds me that I'm alive. We also get out of our chair a lot more. Yes. <laughs> I've I've recently been um, using a lot of parallel compression as I'm trucking. So I'll take 
the kick, snare, and maybe overhead. And molt that out to 1176 and just squash it. And then bring it back into on the console. Yeah, and you're working on a console. You have a tell us about your console. Sorry, we didn't even talk about it yet. That's all right. It's, this is definitely worth talking about. It's a 70, early 70s Neve console that was hand built by Rupert. It looks like a BCM 10, but it's a. It, is, it looks like it. It's similar year model, but it's um, 16 channel, 1073s. There's four 2254s in it, which is my favorite. How long have you had that? About 10 years. 10 years. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and just throw it out there that it was a significant investment for you even 10 oh, years ago. Yeah. <laughs> it was a major decision. Talk about a studio some emo- decision. Emotional investment. It was emotional and financial. Um, this console was at a, a basement here in Nashville. And the moment I saw it, I just had an emotional connection to it. Advance was mixing a record, one of my records, on it. And I just told him, I, I gotta have this. And it is. So we, I talked the guy into letting me borrow it, basically. It's always a great way to start. Yeah. And I insured it and did some repairs on it. And then he said he wanted to sell it, and I said I want to buy it. One dollar. I scraped up everything I had at the time. Well, it's pretty awesome. So with a console like that, it means that when you're recording drums, you have some options to route things out, go through hardware compressors, blend yeah. it back in. Yeah. So we, we let's spin it back to the drums here for just a sec. Sure. You got parallel compression through an 1176. Yeah. And what? <clears throat> how would you describe what that... Um, sounds like, or like what changes about the way the drums sound when you add that element? The the top end squishes down so it feels not as bright and the noise floor raises up. And by noise noise floor, I don't mean humber. Yeah, we're not talking about shh. We're not yet. I wonder if that will even come through after I put all the noise yeah, maybe. on this maybe. podcast. It's it's the room sound. The room sound comes up and fills in the gaps. Yeah. I feel like stuff you might hear is the snares underneath the snare drum kind of making yep. sound when the kick drum hits and, yep, exactly. and things like that, right? Yep, exactly. But all that, to me, I could use that one channel as my drum sound. It just sounds so good. Everything comes through. Everything's balanced and... Do you ever have to um, create that parallel compression during the tracking stage um, just using Pro Tools where you don't have a console to, to route it to? And is there any are there any tricks that those of us with the home studio might use to create that kind of during the tracking stage parallel compression? I've heard of people doing that, but I haven't had great experience getting the same sound. Sometimes the right way to do it is the right way to do it. Yeah. <laughs> right, quote unquote. You know, it's to me it's the right way to do it. And I've also found that a drummer will play differently. If they hear that in the headphones. They, yeah, they they're like, I sound like a badass. I'm gonna play like a badass. Yeah. And um it's, it's really I think amazing. that's so true. I think that's really interesting. Yeah. Um Oh, you're talking about snares. Yeah, snares. Yeah. How do you pick the right snare for the song? Uh, I have my favorite snare sound, and the drummer Paul Eckberg that I use a lot. He has a snare that he, that's sometimes what he puts up first, and sometimes he'll try something else. And, but it's more of a dry snare, and not a lot of ring. But if it's a ruckus rock song, I want that ring, so we'll try something else. Well, particularly on the Robert Wade track. Um, I mean, that's a big, like, chikong, yeah. you know, that kind of thing, which is a bold move and a bold statement, and it totally worked. I have to confess, a lot of that sound was Vance Powell who mixed it. Oh, okay, dig. Right. And um, Well, Vance is all right. He's okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep him for today. <laughs> He's my friend. 
He's, he's awesome. But he always tends to, not always, he leans towards the more riggy snares. And I'm more of a dry type snare guy. Nice. And. Do you guys drink different wine too? We don't drink wine. We drink the same bourbon though. It's the same bourbon. It's good. And what is it? Whatever's at the table. <laughs> <laughs> well, if right, it's open, cool. we'll drink it. Um, how about mixing drums? What are some things that if you've tracked the drums right? Um, well, I guess you, I guess the answer is send it over to the next room over to Vance. That's, but, that's the best. But that's when best. you're doing stuff, are there some things that you find you tend to um, add to that drum sound and process that happen only in the mix stage for you? Yes. Um, I'll compress it again with the, the UA Distressor. I, that sounds so good. It just sounds like the real deal. And when you mix, um, we can get more into this later, but do you try and do you pretty much stay in the box at that point with pro, within Pro Tools, or do you spread yourself all over the console and outboard gear and all kinds of things like that? Or is it all just per project? I typically won't use a ton of outboard gear, but I'll, I will break it out in the console and I'll use an outboard um, C1 compressor. Smart, Alan Smart. So. Oh, right, yeah. That's the SSL style. Yeah. Right? And, but that's really the only outboard gear I'll use. Any, uh, any advice for the rock stars about setting an SSL style compressor to mix through? Or what, are, what are some places that might work? Um, what, what are some settings that might work on your mix? Or what are some settings that you really just probably don't want to do that? You know, my settings are so minimal. I, if it's compressing more than 3 dB, I'm, I'm doing something wrong. If the needle's moving more yeah. than 3 dB, yeah. So it's, very subtle. Um, yeah, that's probably all. Okay, cool. Take cool. it. Less is more. Yeah. I, I feel like I discovered that um, or have or keep discovering it um, in, the t in the ways that when I learned to back off that stereo compression, I started to feel like, oh, this, is, this mix is a whole lot punchier, you know? Yeah. I will use parallel compression in, in, in the, the on, the, on the stereo bus. Or within Pro Tools. Within Pro Tools. Yeah. Like I'll do a band bus, I'll do a drum bus, and a background vocal bus, and each of those have their own compressors. Um, well, let's let's take a, a break for just a second, then we'll come in for the jam session, and we can dig more into okay. mixing and stuff like that. Sure. All right, Rockstar, as a reminder, if you're listening on your mobile mobile device, just click right through there. In the show notes, um, I'll have links to stuff we're talking about, links to um, a YouTube playlist of Mitch's work, and it'll take you to the blog post as well if you want to just get more stuff there. And we'll see you guys in just a moment for the jam session. Roswell Pro Audio brings you microphone design that is out of this world. Endorsed by a growing list of artists and producers like Phil Collin of Def Leppard, Ross Hogarth, who's recorded Van Halen, Ziggy Marley, and the Doobie Brothers, and Supa Dupes, working with Drake, Mary J. Blige, and Eminem. These are all rock stars that have discovered just how great Roswell microphones sound. Check out the Mini K47, which uses a capsule modeled on the one in the vintage U47 at a street price of only $299 or the beautiful Delphos condenser microphone with a capsule tuned like the vintage U67 with great clarity and far lower noise at a street price of only $899. In fact, you are hearing my voice right now on the beautiful Delphos microphone. These mics are carefully crafted by hand and immediately feel good even before you plug them in and hear how great they sound. These are well-built microphones that will last you and your studio a lifetime of great recording. Check out more audio examples of these awesome mics at roswellproaudio.com. Hey, rock stars! We're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Mitch Dane, and we're joining you from Sputnik Sound in Berry Hill, Tennessee. Mitch, are you ready to jam? I am. Let's do it. All right, cool. So I figured, if, as as I usually do, I could kind of completely deconstruct what the jam session is anyway, and we'll just keep asking some cool questions about making records, sure, yeah. and then hit a few it's, on the way out. It's fun. Um, Let's talk a little bit more about mixing where we left off. Sure. Um, when you go to mix a record, do you find that templates are helpful as a place to start? Um, 
what what comments do you want to make about mixing using a template or not using a template? And what does that mean? I do have a template that is, I call my mix bus template. And it's usually just some parallel buses and master tracks like the heater and the, the mix track. And, and uh, I'll just drop, drop it in. And, but I, for the most part, I start from scratch here every time. Well, you said master tracks like the like the heater. Is that what you yep. said? What's the heater? Well, when I mix, a lot of people do this. It's not just me. I will print back into Pro Tools a mix track, but then I'll, I'll bust that as well to a heater track, which is the same mix, except I'll put a plug-in on it that's Oh, the heater, like the loud one, yeah. the loud version. And okay. that's simply just so the artist can hear a loud version of it. Yeah. Okay, dig it. Um, so I was going to ask you, are there some benefits to printing the mix back into your session versus just using the bounce feature? Sounds like that could be one of them, is that it gives you that ability to print multiple versions of the same in one pass. Well, uh, I, I think because I use an outboard piece of gear, I don't think the bus, the bounce feature would work right. for me. Um, I've also heard through circles. Oh, those circles. And I'm not sure if this is true, but I've heard that the printing back in is, you get a different sound. But right. who knows? I'm not sure. Yeah. And sometimes I think it may not matter as much as if we can hear something and it helps us make a decision to do it one way, like, thank God we don't have to worry about which way we're going to do it anymore. We just do it that way. Yeah. <laughs> you know, having a process. I find there's probably more value in having a consistent process than it matters which process you choose. Yeah. You know? And there's another thing about bouncing is it doesn't allow you to listen to the mix again. And I don't know how many times I've started to print Halfway through, I've stopped. I was just going to ask you that very question. Yeah. I, I I start it and I go sit in the back of the control room exactly. where the bass is kicking, and then and the especially if there's a client around or somebody I'm mixing with, you know, then they're like rocking out, and I'm like, I don't even apologize for anyone. Yeah. I just jump right up, walk right past them, cancel, yeah. you know, Gotta make a tweak, thing. back yeah. it up, bounce it again. Although yeah. I wonder sometimes if the first half of the song gets unfair advantage. Or disadvantage from getting over tweaked compared to the second half of a song when we mix like that. What if we could mix it backwards? That would be interesting. I think I uh, I view it kind of like if you're going out drinking with friends, the conversation kind of gets kind of blurry towards the end. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it's like yeah, it's gonna be fine. It'll be fine. fine, fine you've, so. you've gotten this far. You already like the song. Exactly. Yeah. It doesn't really matter what I do now. <laughs> Just as long as you um you know click the link in that YouTube ad and get to whatever it yeah. is afterwards. And, and buy it, actually. Buy actually it. buy this song. Yeah. Hopefully, maybe they already bought it at that point. I don't know. Um, I wanted to ask you about ribbon mics, too, because you talked about uh, mic in the upright bass. Um, I feel like listening to your records, there is a quality of ribbon mics that, that um, it's almost like ribbon mics used well on a record give a recording an earthy tone or something mm -hmm. like that. But at first, I remember that, that ribbon mics can really just make my stuff sound super mushy and kind of like murky. And I wonder if you want to talk about effectively using ribbon mics. What are stuff that people might need to watch out for? Um, what are some lessons learned about using ribbon mics well on a record? What are ribbon mics? What's a ribbon mic? A ribbon mic, in my layman terms, is a microphone that has essentially a diaphragm that's made of metal. It's a thin piece of metal. Very thin, right? Yeah, extremely thin. That works as a membrane that captures sound waves. Literally, rock stars, um, it's thin like a piece of tin foil, but it's thinner than that. Um, I, I took apart my Coles 4038 once, and <laughs> when it, well, it was already not working, so I thought, okay. I'll just try it once myself before I send it out. Fair enough. Yeah, doing it myself didn't work. But it was so, that, that ribbon in there was so light and fluffy that if I moved the mic, it just like wafted in the wind like a spider web. 
And then after that, I was like, okay, I need to treat this mic a little more carefully. If Absolutely. You're that. Like, Jakir King and I used to have a studio together. And he, in his wisdom, would tell people to walk past the microphone slowly. And it's like, okay, I get it now. Because I, you can hear the wind go by the wind yeah. they walk. So yeah, yeah very sensitive. Extremely sensitive. So that's the irony of ribbon mics, right? Is that they don't have a whole lot of high frequency information like a condenser mic does. They sort of gently roll off the, the highs, at least I believe they do. They, mm. they all act a little differently. But they are so sensitive that they pick up more detail even than a condenser mic might. Yeah. And to me, it's like that's that pillowy sound that I, I really like. And it's really ironic that we use ribbon mics, the frail membrane on these drums that are being right. bashed with sticks. But it really captures them well. It makes the transients palatable. Right, appealing. So, yeah. Right. And um, especially if you're using Pro Tools, it really makes it, uh, or any kind of digital uh, workstation. I almost imagine that the ribbon is so sensitive that the and all the tiniest details of drums get picked up immediately, but the bigger movements of all that power and energy probably get abs um, absorbed and compressed maybe slightly in the way that tape does I'm just making this up? That's as a go, great theory. Usually, yeah. I make up most of this shit that, on the podcast. You know, that's that's yeah. why we're so wise. Um, all right, so let's uh, let's warn the rock stars about ribbon mics and what not to do with ribbon mics. Uh, what not to do is treat them roughly. <laughs> um, be careful with phantom power. As in, don't use it. Or as, I guess some ribbon mics now they they had to go and put phantom power on ribbon mics. Yeah, they? and they confuse you which ones. Which ones you can't can, um, yeah. Phantom power can actually burn your ribbon up. Yeah, there are. So I'll be a little clearer, rocksters. There are s traditionally ribbon mics you don't want to send any phantom power to because the phantom power can cause the ribbon to to leap inside the gap and, and destroy the ribbon. Um, but then they went and made like the Royer one twenty two, right? Mm -hmm. It was, I think, one of the first ones Active, that had yeah. a phantom-powered circuit for the ribbon. So yep. you didn't want to send it to phantom. So just be really, really cautious about whether you yeah. send phantom power to that ribbon mic. Make sure it's the right one. Yeah, you want to, like, if they're going to be set up for a while, the microphone, you want to bag it. Yeah, what does that mean, bag it? I'll put a cover over it, a dust cover, because dust on that thin membrane can change the quality. But... Bag it very, very gently and never jerk the bag off. You know, really be slow about how you put it on and off. What about when you need to move the mic around the room from one place to another? How do you do that? Keep the bag on it? Uh, what's the right answer? I don't know. <laughs> That's, I've been doing that more. Keep I've been the bag on? like my calls. I'll keep the bag on it and just move it around the room. Keep the wind that off. Way. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose that, that would work. I If you're going to bump the mic stand at all, I would maybe take the mic off the stand before you move it. But Yeah. I remember one of the first ones I saw that it, it comes in a, or mine came in a plastic case that you can close and, and clip down. And I was told by somebody, um, put a plastic bag over the mic before you even do that because the pressure, pressure change yep. can can do that too. That's exactly right. Closing the lid on this. Thing. So suffice it to say, ribbon mics are very sensitive. Um, they sound wonderful. They also can have really huge proximity effects, right? They can. Yep. So, what are some um, what are some places? Oh, and I was going to say with this one last thing about drums, uh, I lost one of my Coles ribbons because it was out in front of a kick drum, and the kick drum had the front head with the hole in it. Yep. And a lot oh, of wind goes yep. flying out of that hole, and I, and it, it was probably still like two feet in front of the kick yeah. drum, and that blast of wind took out the mic. So, yeah. just heads up on that, rock stars. Yeah, I usually use a 44 in front of my kick. Now, the 44 is a, is a tougher ribbon than a Coles, isn't it? Or is it still pretty sensitive? You know, that's a great question. I don't know. But it's a lot more expensive, I know that. <laughs> so it's, it's huge and it's heavy. But I'll put a pop filter in front of it to help cut out some of those plosives. 
Um, On a kick. I, I think the last time, maybe uh, one of the last times I saw Wes Dooley was here at a party from AEA. Um, mm-hmm. Do you want to educate the rock stars a little bit about um, where, you know, these are, some of these are traditional ribbon mics, but now they're made by um, AEA, which is audio. Um, AEA is. Yeah. Anyway, it's um, Wes Dooley's company. Yeah, tell tell us about Wes and and what are do you have some favorite mics, some favorite ribbons that you I, like using? I do. Um, Wes Dooley used to work at RCA. If, if I have my facts straight, and he um, started building his own mics, I think with the same patent. And I'm not exactly sure if those, if I'm telling the truth here or not, but. He makes exact replicas of the 44 and the 77. Yeah, I know they've got some other brands out they there. Have the, they have the KU4, which is fantastic. Yeah. It's like a... Is that the angled front? Yeah. It sounds so good. Like a little rain in the background. I, I know, I can hear it. Very pleasant. I don't know if you can hear it, rock stars. My editing chops might be so good that you'll never even know there is rain in the background, but we'll see. Um. um. Okay, groovy. Let's see. Let's move from ribbons to uh, we did mixed templates. Great. Um, let's talk a little bit about the content of some of the artists that you've worked with because I know you've done uh, you've worked with a number of Christian artists. Um, one of the artists I, I was checking out of your work, Sean Groves, um, seemed to have a real message behind what he's doing. I sure. mean, like he was going to Ethiopia and working with children there and stuff. And and you talked about. Um, you know, at the beginning of this, you talked about also reaching to friends for help. Mm-hmm. And I know help can mean much more than just, you know, like, how do I, how much high frequency should I jam into this snare drum? Mic? Yeah. So I wondered if you wanted to talk about um, how it feels to work with artists and make records that sort of have a message to share with the world um, and whether those sessions are different for you. Um. I would say, I guess just to be fair, do you feel like you have a lot of experience I do. with artists that have a real message? I do. And I actually, coming totally clean, I have my own faith that I, I live out of. And because I've been a believer for so long, I, I'm a little cynical of modern Christianity and how watered down it has become and disingenuous people have become. But when I come across people who are believers and they get it, it's really intriguing to me. and It's refreshing. And I think music in general, whether it's as a Christian message or just humanitarian, it, it's, it can be healing. And that's, that's the part of music I really gravitate towards. And I, th- you know, we could get into the, the what's the purpose of music, right? Or but I, what is the purpose of music? <laughs> the, well, that's that's another podcast, probably. But I think it should somehow betray beauty. Yeah, and it doesn't mean it has to be quaint. The bad beauty could be badass, you know, through a, through a, a great mix or whatever. But just done with excellence. And I think somehow that excellence reflects our creation, you know, our our being, our, our creator. Yeah. yeah. I've felt um I felt like a realization about what music is for me was that music is human beings communicating to each other. Yeah. You know. And I, I'm I'm looking forward to deconstructing that that uh, description already, you know, um, because I, I am also a huge fan of EDM music. Yeah. And I thought about that. I was like, well, how does that apply? Well, I think in that case, maybe, you know, the communication is between the composer and the, the listener at the other end or a room full of people dancing or whatever. Um, but I, I think that, that, you know, what's important to me about that uh, and as you may know, I'm sort of also in this this battle to save home studios here in Nashville yeah, too. Good job, by the way. Thank you, thank you very much. Mm. And and one of the things that I've said as part of that is that the importance of 
you know, Nashville particularly and, and anywhere, but Nashville still being a place where people get together face to face professionally, you know, w- w- world-class musicians to make record face to face in front of microphones, yeah. which is a real expression of a human being communicating with another human and that communication going back and forth, that feedback. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the things that I think needs to be allowed for home studios and, and for making music in general, you know? Absolutely. Um, maybe we should talk about that for a little bit, just about that difference between what it means to have two people playing music, the back and forth that happens with that versus man versus computer when you're doing overdubs. Um, that's sort of how I describe it. You know, it's like me versus the machine. What comments can you make about what it means to make music those two different ways? Uh, this means this means a great deal to me. So I'd, I've I've found that just as you have alluded to that music made in community or with other people is so much more rich. And if you are just doing a record where the drums are played and then a bass player comes in and plays and someone else plays guitar on different days, you're missing out on the synergy. You're missing out on the the cross-reverence of creativity of the guitar player playing a riff that the bass player catches up on and all of a sudden yeah. it becomes music. Yeah. And plus, At lunchtime, you're not all sitting around the table having lunch together. Yeah. One of my favorite parts of the day, too. It's amazing. And it, and there's also the bleed factor that's part of that in, in between the notes sound that's so appealing to most people, at least. Yeah. Well, maybe we should talk about that, too. Um, when you talk about bleed factor... What are some instrument combinations that end up in the same room bleeding on each other when you're when you're recording? I usually will always record bass and drums and electric together. So if you listen closely to the drum track, you'll hear electric guitar in it if it's soloed. And is that because the amp is in the same room with the drums or it's just bleeding through the ISO booth because it's close enough? Yeah, the latter. It's yeah. the ISO booth. Our ISO booths are... Not very ISO. They're right. they're booths. They're close by. <laughs> but like um, the B three will you know you'll hear drums in the B three track, or if there's an upright player playing in another room, you'll hear drums in that. Well, I think that's an interesting lesson, though. It's a reminder that bleed can mean you're still isolating things, but it's not as isolated as doing an overdub on a different day. Yeah. And it, it's still guys in the same room, generally, looking at each other, deciding when that last note's gonna right gonna hit. Now, do you sometimes have situations where the isolation between two instruments isn't enough? Like, for example, my oh goodness, uh, what's what's an example in my world? Like, the drums are just too loud in the piano mics, but you still want the musicians performing together and then you overdub the piano right after that. And all of a sudden the sound of the track cleans up, but you still gained something from that initial performance of people together. Yeah. It, it happens uh, oh, quite often actually where acoustic guitars are a good example. Exactly right. that's, that's exactly what I was going to say where the, the player's playing along and it's usually the artist playing and he gets the experience of playing with the band, but then we'll often have to just re- redo the guitar right, right afterwards. Yeah, and the acoustic, um, the drummer's informed by that acoustic happening in real time. Yeah. Uh, that was a lesson I learned in my own band early on was like, every time the singer really delivered during our tracking, we always got such better takes on everything. You know? Oh, yeah. And if he was phoning it in, I was like, well, you just need a few placeholders. It was like yeah. the band was just, we were just struggling to try and make music, you know? Yeah. Um, all right, cool. Uh, what else about Bleed? What other stuff do we need to know about Bleed? Anything to pop into mind? Uh, sometimes it's a, a hidden gift that, like, as a producer, sometimes I might, 
mute everything and just have the drums and vocal happening. But if you hear a guitar kind of faintly in the background, it's kind of like... That can be a cool thing. Yeah. Yeah. Or vice versa, if it's just acoustic and vocal and I mute the drums. How about click? Do you enjoy hearing click? I do not (laughs) enjoy Absolutely not. Okay. Any reminders to us um, as far as avoiding accidentally having click later on in the record? Is there is there a procedure you go through to make sure that doesn't happen? Well, I make sure that the drummer is the only person that has to click loud. And everyone else just needs it if there's a large hole in the song. Right. Um, it's like if the song gets quiet enough, then the rest of the band really hears that click yeah. as a guide for landing on the downbeat. Exactly. But when the when the song's not rocking, you don't need to have the click loud. No, just the, the, music. the drums. Um, that is a thing about click that I don't like is I feel like I, when a band hears that click in the headphones, they're now, it's like them versus the click instead of yeah. them playing with each other. And even if they tell me everything's fine, <laughs> I still know that there's a difference there, you know? Yeah, I'll, I'll have a conversation with the band before and say, we're going to try to do this together. So we want to make sure everyone's hearing each other and we're playing together as a band. And um, there's always a case occasionally where I'll just happen to go listen to the, the mix and it's just the guitar and click or something. It's like, where's the rest of the band, you know? So some people get it, some people don't. Yeah. Um, so then you've you've done a little bit of recording with the drums. Do you always sort of pause? Do you, do you write a little note to yourself, check, click, bleed, and you pause everybody and solo the drums and just make sure you're not hearing click? I, I usually don't listen to click while I'm behind the console. Oh, so you can hear it during the tracking if yeah. it's happening? Yeah. So that implies that you set up... Um, Alternate mixes for the musicians from what you're hearing in the control room. Yes, my fullback system on my console is set up in such a way that I can give them a different mix than what I'm listening to. So I don't. I can solo out here without soloing what they're listening to. So it's not like a complex Pro Tools session where you've no. got aug sends going to different headphones and stuff no. like that. All right, cool. I only do that if it, they want to more me. Right. Then I'll send them out another channel. That's what I have set up in my studio. I wouldn't mind having fancier headphone mixers, but truthfully, most of what people want more of in a mix is just more of themselves. Yeah. Occasionally, they want a whole lot less of somebody in the band, but um, mostly it's people just want to hear more of themselves. And honestly, if they're listening to the band together in their in their cue system, and the bass player is like, I really could use more me. I'll ask the rest of the band, hey, could you all use some more bass? And usually they're like, yeah, sure, turn it up. Yeah, cool. So I'll just turn it up on their mix. So everyone. Um, what about communication from the band back to you in the control room? Do you have any special ways that you make it easy for them to communicate back to you? Yeah, I will have every station have a talkback mic, which goes into a little Mackie mixer, and this sends me a signal, and I can press it quite a bit. And it's on a, on a separate channel of the console that I can mute on and off. Okay, so, um, and they, they have sort of a close vocal mic style talkback no, mic? No, it's kind of like just on their on the music stand or their, their uh, headphone mix stand. All right, and if you got somebody who just is noodling in between, you're gonna, you have to ask them to, hey, hang tight for a second yeah. because we can't hear what we're saying to each other. Yep. Which is probably good for the whole process anyway. Yes. <laughs> um, I like that idea a lot of doing the um, compressed thing. And I, I've, I've learned my own versions of that too. I'll do, I'll bring a mic from one of the existing mics out there into Pro Tools, you know, one that's kind of near enough to everybody, and then limit that maximum and then put a second limiter on it maximum and then turn the volume way down. You got to yeah. be real careful you don't turn the volume of that track way back up again because oh, you yeah. have explosively loud stuff. Yeah. Um, and then there's a cool plugin in um, a free one, Mutomatic. And I apologize, I don't have the the, uh, the plugin manufacturer's name on top of my head. But that one, every time you stop Pro Tools, it opens up. Every time you press play or record, it'll mute that track. So oh, that's, that's fascinating. Yeah, I'll show you. I'll that's actually a very useful tool. Yeah. Um, 
All right, cool. So let's see. Uh, one last question about specifics, mastering. What do you want to say about the process of mastering? Um, do you ever, well, you already gave us some good tips about printing a louder mix for the artist. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes time to mastering, to do mastering, um, have you found that you like to find a favorite mastering engineer? What are some of the things that make mastering really positive experience for you? How often are you in control of that? And, um, you know, is, is a dialogue with your mastering engineer really important or how, what do you want to say about all that stuff? Oh yeah. And how loud should shit be? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's funny. Um, I have probably five mastering people that I'll go to, depending on what style they, they are. Some people are loud. Some people are glossy. Some people are very open and, and then some people are cheap. You know? So it's interesting. It's almost like selecting the right musicians for yeah. a tracking session. You yeah. just need to choose the right people to work with for your mastering as well. Yeah, for, for all country stuff, there's a guy that I go to, and there's for, for more polished pop stuff, I'll go to someone else. I give them a very open mix, so they have tons of headroom to do whatever they want to with. So it's, I'd rather them not squash it. Yeah. I want it to be industry standard, but not like, the loudest record on the block. Um, where do you like to listen to your mixes when they're done to know that you've done them right? Oh, let's Before do them. mastering. On my, mom, on my studio, yeah. So no, um, you know, you don't have like a, um, a Pee Wee Herman style tricycle outside or something no. with the jam and stereo on it that you go reference everything on? Maybe I should though. That sounds <laughs> awesome. I just made that up, but <laughs> that does sound like a good way to do it. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. Um, are there, is there a process of listening to records that you feel are right on your studio monitors so that you always sort of have a reference point for yourself as far as what's, what's the best sounding record and whether you're staying on track? Yeah. I, in fact, if I go to another studio, when I first walk in, I'll ask them if they, if I could put on something just medium volume in the background while I'm setting up just so I can get used to the way things sound. They may not be the best speakers in the world, but if you get used to them, you'll, you'll do fine. You just know what know what they're doing, know what yeah. to expect. Yeah. yeah. All right, cool. Well, let's just jump into the uh, the final questions here. Um, this is the original jam session sure. questions. We'll just kind of hit a couple of them. Um, when you started out in recording, what was holding you back? I think the title of producer even when you call it a record producer, it sounds so pretentious and so lofty that it's like being a rocket scientist or scientist or something. I, I think I was just lack of confidence. Like, could I actually do that? Yeah, big time for me too. Yeah. I always was like, I wanted to be producing records, but I was always like, well, I'm an engineer. I mean, I really want to do more producing. You know, mm -hmm. I always had to apologize my yeah, way into exactly. an answer. Never again. And even now, when I I went to a reunion back in my hometown, and like, so what do you do? And I'm a record producer, you know, because <laughs> you just because it sounds way cooler than it is. It's, you should just um, do more podcast episodes. It's, I'm telling you, man, you do enough of these things, and you and you write out your bio, and then you confidently go around, you know, claiming all these big credits for yourself along the way. Yeah. Um, all right, Groovy. So uh, I see Vance is waving at us oh, through the glass there. He wants to come in, I can tell. He wants to come in. We'll, we'll <laughs> hang with him. We'll hang with him. Um, all right. Uh, do you remember some of the best advice you received? Maybe even as you were starting out, was there anybody that really kind of... Yeah, I think it was always um, be learning from people. Yeah. Never get stuck in ruts. Shake things up all the time. Okay, I seem to get stuck in ruts anyway, but yeah, all the time. Me too. Try and shake them off and keep learning. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I would enjoy any of this if I wasn't learning anymore. Exactly. I don't think it would be much fun. You know, you know what's really great is when I learn something from either an intern. Yeah, totally. Or someone very unlikely. It just thrills me. Um, interns do things like walk in to my Pro Tools, which I've been using for. 25 years now and 
take the mouse and like swipe it across 10 tracks and like turn something on or off. I'm like, I didn't even know you. I didn't know you could do yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> you know? There's a kid I just saw yesterday that some guy from Blackbird Academy created an app that helps you learn Pro Tools shortcuts. Oh, great idea. And it's like, great idea. We'll have to find out what that is and make sure the rock stars can Yeah, play. absolutely. All right. I'm on to you, kid from Blackbird. <laughs> I'll email Mark and find out who it is. Exactly. Um, all right, dig it. So we've talked about, uh, we've certainly shared a lot of tips um, for the studio, hardware tools. I mean, that's a question I like to ask if there's any favorite stuff. Obviously, your Neve there is a nice one. Is there any, is there any um, new thing hardware-wise that you're excited about recently? Something you've been having fun with? Uh, the Burls. You know, the, the Burls, yeah. The, that's huge. Um, Ballpark speaking, what do we need to start saving up for as a budget if we want to get uh, burls for our converters? Um, you might want to look at your kidney. <laughs> kidney right. Yeah, they're they're pricey, but you know it's like buying an old tape machine back when they yeah it was a big deal, but worth it. Yeah, it just changes your sound. That's cool. All right, um, how about some exciting software? You know, I'm a huge fan of UA. Okay. All their plugins are fantastic. Tell us about that. Anything new that you've been checking out with from them? I mean, you talked about the uh, distressors. The distressors are great. And I got to uh, do a little video with Dave Durr, which is oh, coming soon when I was at great. Winter Nam. He's a cool cat. Now it's kind of like which child do you like love the best? It's it's um they're all fantastic. I, there's also this sounds kind of dumb, but the the Sansamp plugin that everyone has. I use it all the time. I mean, probably makes every mix. It you could put on anything that sounds too plasticky, and it just makes it sound cool. Yeah, I, you, I often use that on. I copy the bass DI track, and yeah. I automatically have that ready to just sort of dial in some amp tone into the mix. And sometimes you don't even have to touch it; just just putting it on, just like the as fact, is the, the stock. Nice. <laughs> I like plugins like that because it's so much quicker. <laughs> All right. Um, how about uh, any any resource or tips for the business side of this? Um, we covered some of that, but anything else you want to talk about as far as, uh, you know, what do you tell your your interns? How do you advise them on how to do this for a living? Actually, the current intern and my assistant and I have been working on an algorithm to help young producers decide what to charge. I'm not even sure I can spell algorithm. <laughs> I think it starts with an A. But, like, based on their experience, based on how much they have invested in their gear, um, and also it takes into consideration what their monthly living expenses are. Yeah. Maybe we should talk a little bit about the idea of race to the bottom, too, which I think is something... I don't know if producers and engineers and record makers have been always grappling with that. I feel like there was some time there in the 70s and 80s where everybody was on a race to the top. Maybe in the yeah. 90s, we sort of started dealing with that. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the ways that people, you know, what what are the pitfalls? I guess that's a good way to, to say it about um, doing a race to the bottom, you know, undercharging for what you do and creating an environment where the the amount of uh, income for making records well goes down and down and like what the result is. Any, any thoughts on that? Anything you've seen or anything you'd, you'd like to not see again? Yeah, there's, there's obviously the quality aspect that's, that has, if it hasn't already, it's going to, to a degrade. But I've got myself into a, whether it's a, it's a, a great situation or a horrible situation, do I can't race to the bottom? I have so much invested in this place, and and I offer an experience of making records, not just just doing it. It, it it's a fun experience to be here for three weeks or so. And it's fun to be here for an hour and a half <laughs> talking to you here too. So uh, this is a beautiful place, Rockstars. If you ever need to come make a record in Nashville. Um, or anywhere, just come to Nashville and come here. You'll oh, love it. It's, thank, it's, thank you. It, it feels like I'm in the coolest, fanciest hotel 
ever, you know, in, in a, in a positive way, uh, not hotel, like meaning anything negative, but just like, I feel like, um, I feel pampered. I guess that's what I'm saying. Okay. Um, so yeah, I, I have to charge a premium for what I, I, uh, offer, but I feel like it's worth it. I feel like it's what an artist will walk away with is high quality, well thought out product, and it's representative of who they are, a better representation of who they are. Well, let me um, take it to the next step there and ask the question about um, what you see happening with artists around you that are finishing a really high quality record and then doing whatever's next with it. What are some things that you see happening now for artists um, releasing their record to the world in a good way? Well, to bring it back to, you know, what I said first about me, me being an, an artist myself a long time ago, I found the best way is to get out there and play and make fans. If you make a, uh, a super fan, they'll they'll make 10 more fans. So there's no easy way of doing this. And if you're not willing to work really, really, really hard, then why are you doing it? So I mean, there's obviously social media is very helpful, which I didn't have back then. Right. I didn't even have a cell phone or email. <laughs> I found a way and obviously people were buying more records back then. Yeah. It was the only way to consume music. Yeah. Did I just say consume music? Consume I music. I said that. Sorry, everybody. Um, the hard work. Yeah. Hard work. Um, are you seeing examples of people finding success with their, their music and their records and their career? Is it all, is everything just so intertwined now that it's all just, part of a bigger picture. I mean, like, do you make a record and then, uh, and then that record sells and that's the complete equation or is it more like, um, you make a high quality record because that's part of the, the bigger picture of your, your music career and how it all adds up. I mean, I feel like something that Probably that I'm sure existed, but just became part of a dialogue. Of course, was the that that recordings aren't necessarily just records for sale. Now they might also be a great song and a great recording that might get used in a TV or a film sync license and that sure. sort of stuff. You know, I see the industry kind of splitting, and there's a the artists that chase after the Spotify playlists or the TV placement with a single or, or an EP. And then there are the artists that they don't care about this single. They want to build fans and they want to give their fans a high resolution picture, audio picture of themselves through right. a record, 10 song record. An experience. Yeah. Even a vinyl. And the B sides of a vinyl are just as important to the, the fan to know about the artist as the A side. And those folks that are shooting for the single are missing out on their fan base. Yeah, it's true. I mean, as a music fan myself, I remember there were a lot of songs that weren't hits that I loved from yeah. artists I loved, you know? Yeah. It's part of the experience. And I think the way I make records here, it caters more towards those folks who want to make full-length records. And um, that's what I like to listen to. Yeah. I buy records still. Me too. All right. So let's jump to the final question, Mitch. And sure. again, we appreciate you being here on Recording Studio Rockstars with you, us. So thank you so much for putting in all this time. Um, this one is hypothetical. We're okay. going to take the way back studio machine. You're going to okay. go back and find young Mitch and uh, tap yourself on the shoulder and you turn around and you say, you know, I don't know if you had a mustache and a beard back then. <laughs> I'm guessing you didn't. So you say, who are you, old guy? Yeah. You know, uh, sorry, not that old. But um, old enough. you say, well, I've come back to give you this one bit of advice. Here's the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the studio yourself one day. What advice would you give yourself if you could go back and do that? 
I would say Mitch. <laughs> Get your act together, kid. Like, yeah. You know, I, th- I think experience doing every little project that comes along will make you a better producer. And um, taking risks. That whether that's finding a talent that doesn't pay very much and nurturing them or finding a piece of gear that you really love yeah. is going to appreciate. Like that Neve or the Burls. Yeah, or... Or yeah, investing in building a studio. Like exactly, this. Yeah. You guys built this place from zero. Yeah, it, it, was, a, it was a huge risk and involved my my family and in some ways a lot of my friends. and So there is there is no fail. Right, it's you got to do it right. You just got to do it right and keep moving forward. Surround yourself with people, again, who can help you become a better version of yourself. Um, when you're faced with taking a leap um, and taking a risk on something, how do you know when it's time to jump? How do you know when you're, it's just you're ready to go? That is the big question, isn't it? It's a big yeah. question. I don't know. Maybe it's too big. I There's just something inside that... Do you sort of... Um, is it sort of a process of you just done everything you, you can do to be ready and then it's just you know that the only next step is just go for it? Yeah, it depends on the thing. Sometimes it's just getting angry. It's like, I'm sick of being, or I'm sick of renting. I've rented for the past 11 years, so I'm not going to buy my own space. Yeah. Or, you know, if someone's faced with whether I should move cities, you know, I'd, this town may not offer you anything, so you have to move out of this town, go, yeah. s- go somewhere else. And I, I feel like with every um, risk, you can list all of the things that could happen. Like, what if oh, it doesn't yeah. work? What if this doesn't happen? What if they don't like it? What if Yeah. What if nobody wants to listen to my podcast? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, wise counsel helps. Yeah. Having people. Yeah. Well, that's what we're doing here, hopefully, right? I hope so. <laughs> well, Mitch, thank you so much for being on Recording Studio Rockstars. Um, we've gone a few minutes over time here, too, so really appreciate you giving your time um, and just being here with us to talk and share all this wisdom. Let the Rockstars know, please, where they can go to find out more about you, find out more about Sputnik Sound. Um, we have a website, SputnikSound.com. Um, How do we spell it? S. I'm, I'm dyslexia. <laughs> it's with a K. S P U T N I K. N I K sound. Sound.com. And Vance and I both have a side that you could peruse. Or you can Super use. cool landing page on your website, by the way. Oh, thanks. It's badass. It looks like you're just, you know, it's like old black and whites of Saturn. Yeah. Really cool. You know, you could always email me at MitchDane at Mac.com or Mitch at MitchDane.com. I'll be happy to chat with you. All right, cool. Well, rock stars, a reminder that you can find links to all of what we're talking about in the show notes at rsrockstars.com. Use the magnifying glass, search Mitch, and I'm sure it will pop right up there. Um, I haven't interviewed Mitch Easter yet, so there shouldn't be any confusion. I thought that'd be fun. I like it. Yeah, looking forward to that too, though. And, um, um, I'll include a, a link to YouTube playlist so you can go listen to some of Mitch's records and Super. link to the website and everything like that. Thanks again, Mitch, for letting us come invade your studio and hang out with you. Uh, rock stars, come to Nashville. Come Thanks. to Sputnik Sound. Check it out. Thanks, Lich. All right, man. We'll see you around. See you. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help reach more people. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And if you want more free content, all you have to do is text RS Rockstars to 33444. Again, that's RS Rockstars to 33444. And I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, and podcast updates. 
And I'll let you know about any upcoming giveaway offers, all totally free. Thanks for listening. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Music.